sometimes when you're on a podcast and you find yourself wanting to ask all the questions, you open your mouth and you say, I really want to interview you. Can we do that? And then sometimes the podcast host <laughs> says, yes. And then you say, uh-oh, <laughs> I have to do this. And then you get the calendar invite and then you find yourself here. We are talking billions today, mm -hmm. but I like to think in more of the Carl Sagan sense, billions and billions and billions. Bogomil, yeah. it's so good to be here with you on the other side of the conversation. Uh -huh. Well, Matt, uh, first of all, thank you. And I told you how grateful I am that you wanted to spend this hour or more with me. And you and I had a couple of great calls. One of them we recorded and turned to an episode with you as the star. And then you told me that you have more questions for me. And I said, okay, let's, let's sit down and record. And I have no idea what kind of questions you have for me today. And I'm, I'm just ready for the adventure. Let's, let's see where this takes us. I am so ready for this adventure. And yeah, we're going to see where this goes. I got a giant list of questions. I have no oh, battle plan to get through, uh -huh. except, except for this. I do have a battle plan on where to start. And I promise your audience, I will ask you, your normal opening question and a oh, slight no. variation. But first, it's Valentine's Day when we're recording this. I know this will come out some later period, but it is Valentine's Day. Uh -huh. I want the listeners to pull that into their hearts. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, I know you're a man who loves a long walk on the beach I do. in more ways than one, but I really wanted to ask you about this long walk on the beach with your wife before you gave that TEDx talk. Oh, goodness. Wow. We actually were on a walk on the beach this morning and and she went surfing i took pictures of her this morning so it was a nice way to start valentine's day but yes yeah, so tedx that was a few years back and i already had some experience giving speeches but tedx is a format in itself you know there's a time limit and there are 100 people in the audience you probably know very few people in the audience you usually travel somewhere you get invited and uh, the host reached out to me and she did a remarkable job collecting a couple of speakers. And I prepared my topic and I thought about it really hard. And the topic was the great investor in you. I wanted to show people what Peter Lynch inspired in me years ago in One Up on Wall Street, that everybody could be and should be an investor. It doesn't mean that you have to be a professional stock picker, but I think there is a beauty and benefit on many levels. And I'm sure we'll talk more about it in becoming a shareholder in businesses. So that was the big premise of the talk. Now the talk was coming up. We traveled to California. It was a, a small university, Laverne. And we went for a walk around the property just to see where I will give that talk. It's always nice to see the space before you go. I highly recommend it, especially if it's an important talk to you. And then on one of the beaches, we went for a long walk and I was practicing <laughs> my speech because you have to pretty much have big pieces of it committed to memory because in those, I don't know if it's 15, 16 minutes, I think, you have to just keep on talking and it has to be a nice quick flow. You can't be thinking about it. So, But anyways, Megan got to hear the speech a million times before I stood on the stage and actually gave the talk. But all this to say, I think preparation paid off, knowing the space paid off. And I think what I kept in mind was that in the audience, I have people that are very curious about what I have to share. And I saw it immediately after the talk. People walked up to me and told me stories of about investing and money and inheritance and trouble and mistakes and successes. And when you give a speech, you create this very intimate bond with your audience. And it happens so quickly. It can be even overwhelming because they get to see you from such a such an honest, vulnerable place that they feel very comfortable coming to you and sharing something very intimate about their lives. And I think books can do it. I think articles can do it. I think definitely a podcast can do it because people get to hear your voice or see your face. But I think standing on a stage and sharing a story really opens up the audience to something really beautiful. So I, I really remember the most the few hours that followed when people approached me and asked me questions that was really powerful much more than the 15 minutes when i was sweating on the stage <laughs> as is always the case what about the preparation because 
I want to really highlight this point. It's such a distinct, a TED talk or a TEDx talk is such a distinctly packaged experience, mm -hmm. both in preparation and then in the connection that it induces. So anything else just about the, the way that that's packaged really feels meaningful to me. I love it. And I, I love the constraint, the time constraint that you really have to choose hmm. and pick even individual words. And I wrote it and rewrote it. I don't know how many times. And I was an active member of the, one of New York Toastmaster clubs at the time. So I actually brought pieces of it to the meetings and shared it with a couple of mentors that I had in the club at the time. And I was looking for all kinds of feedback. There's a funny thing that happens when you ask for feedback because uh, people don't know how far you want to go with that feedback. And, and they started rewriting <laughs> my speech with me. <laughs> and, and I had to say politely, at the end of the day, it has to be my words. So I, I, I took the feedback and I moved things around and maybe I tweaked it here and there. But at the end of the day, it has to feel like it's my own words. I don't know if it's said you know, perfectly, but it's my own words. That's the way I would say it. And when I interact with people that have been you know, listening to the podcast or reading my books or articles, they tell me it's something that you would have said, you know, they, they sense this consistency in how I would say things. So when you're giving such a speech, I think you have to make it truly yours. And I think that's what resonates with the audience, even if it's imperfect. I've listened to some TED Talks that feel like they could take some work on the speech delivery side, but it was such a personal, intimate story. You know, it's like a friend that is like choking up to tell you the story, what they just saw. And they want to tell you just the way they feel in the moment, right? It's not polished. Yeah. It's not perfect. But you feel what they felt in the moment when they jumped, when they did something. And I think those kind of speeches really strike a chord. I'm putting pins in this because I got to ask you, I don't want to ask you your normal question. I feel like you've shared a lot of this. Tell me. Why do you think it's so interesting to ask people about their childhood or their first experience with money or their earliest memories? Why is that so curious to you? I think there's a, a treasure trove in that period of life that is tricky to explore because I think we move on very quickly we grow up, we go to school, we become adults, and we kind of want to forget a lot of the maybe less pleasant moments or the things that we realized were less pleasant as we grow up, we might not even realize at the time. And I notice with you know, people that I interact with, with clients that they came and worked with me, that those stories come up, and I don't even have to ask, they do come up. In a podcast format, I have limited time, so I kind of want to invite some of those stories if my guests are willing to share. The big overarching goal is to find the true why. I was sitting in a conference a few weeks ago and I was looking around and there these are all investment professionals, very smart people, lots of uh, brain power in the room. And I'm thinking to myself, and I asked somebody in the room about it over coffee later, how all of us in this room, I don't know, a hundred some people, decided to dedicate their life to understanding a very small sliver of the universe. I'm sure they're curious about all kinds of things. We have all kinds of you know, passions, but their main, main focus is how does money work? How does investing work? How do I, some people say, you know, get rich and some people say stay rich. Some people think of both, but why is that so important to you much more than, uh, I don't know, producing beautiful paintings or pieces of music or I don't know, teaching kids to read or <laughs> building walls or cathedrals or whatever you want to build. Why do you care so much? How does money work? You know, we buy stocks that uh, have businesses behind them and they uh, you know, reinvest money and they grow and they uh, find new customers, produce new products and so on. But behind it all, why do you care? And I think in those questions about childhood, I get to see a glimpse of that very, very young individual that somehow found that this aspect of life matters to them the most. And I, I can tell you more, but I'll pause for a second if you have a follow up. This is going to be a hard bank left turn mm -hmm. with like three callbacks inside of it. You're making me think of, the, so it's something we started to talk about before we pressed record on this. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I promise I'm going to tie this together. This is you're talking to me. You know what happens. Talk to me, and I'm taking notes. As <laughs> I, you know, go I can tell. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is how we roll. <laughs> the before the podcast, before we pressed record, at least we were talking about both of our love for and confusion by beautiful confusion uh-huh. by rapid fire questions when we're podcast guests and yes. somebody's got the list of here's yes. the thing. Mm-hmm. Both of us have had moments with these uh-huh. of profound truth, introspection, other things in the way we've answered. Mm-hmm. Can you tell the story really quickly about the rapid fire prompt question and the uh-huh. answer you gave and this connection? And I promise I'm calling back to both of these prior points because. Yeah. Yeah. Cause so I, <laughs> I was, I was a guest on a podcast a few days ago and it's a, it's a young podcaster, 17 year old from Portugal, David Barbato. And, uh, his podcast is called value hunt. And at the end of the, the interview, he said, I, I'll ask you quick questions. I don't think he even told me he's going to ask me those questions, but I said, sure, let's, let's, let's do it. And, uh, he asked me, well, he basically said one word and what comes to mind. And he said the word, among a few of them, he said the word past. And I immediately said lessons. And I was telling you before we started recording that I don't know where the answer came from, but now that I think about it and I had time to think about it, this is the, the best, most honest answer I could have given. And I would still give the same one. And I elaborated that to me, past means lessons. Both when I look at my own past, most immediate one, and you know, 40 years on this planet, and the, the big picture history, because we can pick up books about different periods of time and then see how those periods rhyme with whatever is happening right now. And I, I mentioned to you, and I, I wrote about it in some essays, and that when the pandemic started, the, my first reaction was, I want to find a history book. I've, I've heard stories about the plagues and the pandemics of the past. We all have. But I just wanted to read a book that kind of zooms in and tells me, how did it feel when Europe was going through those plagues and, and cities were closing up and, you know, Newton was sent home to, to study and work from home. He actually said that these were the most productive years for him when he decided to leave uh, the, the city and hide in the countryside. And I think he did his most creative work. He wrote about it in his journals. But the one thing that I took away from reading that book was that each pandemic came in waves. And at the time, in the first weeks of the pandemic, everybody was telling us that's, you know, two or three weeks, we're going to be done with it. And I was living in New York, and I, I couldn't really imagine that we're going to be done with it <laughs> in a few weeks. But the idea of waves, that's, that was the biggest idea from that book that really struck a chord with me. And I realized, what would it be like if we have a wave after wave after wave? for a couple of years? How do we live? How do we function? How do businesses run? How politicians will respond? How this will all operate? So whenever I have doubts, I look at history books and just look for the answers. I feel like they history rhymes. You just have to know where to look. So anyways, the long answer to your question, the word was past, and I said lessons, and I still believe that's true. Are these books... Are these attempts to capture this stuff? Do you see that as an applied constraint, an applied method of focusing the lesson? You mean history books? History books, uh, a section in a book, writing one of your many brilliant essays through the pandemic. <laughs> Do you see these as natural constraints that help focus an idea? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I mean, you... you... You and I had a conversation about, you know, writing a, a complete thought. And, and that's that I give credit to you. And I really like that idea. It's, it's interesting when we tell a story, it has a, a beginning, a middle and the end. And this is the highly respected form that you and I talked about. How throughout history, you know, stories have uh, those three parts, but each, each thought you know, if I tell you something, like I told you that I think past means lessons, that's not a complete thought, but I explain <laughs> what it means in a larger context yeah. to me, right? So I, I try to find a way to complete this thought. It's like a little snowball, and then you can do with it whatever you want. You can disagree, you can agree, maybe you can, you know, embrace it and apply it in your life. 
I have no control over it, but what I'm trying to offer, it's, it's a closed loop. The essays are, you know, somebody asked me if you had to choose between you know, writing, podcasting, and, and everything else that you do, and invest, investing, but you know, the, the core of what I do, manage money for other people. I said, I, I can't really choose because they all coexist together and they feed on each other, right? So a conversation with a client inspires an article that inspires a question that I have for somebody on the podcast who actually faced something like that in their own life because they inherited money or they lost money or they lived in a country where all of the money they had was confiscated. And, and you know, it, it's just, it's all a thread that connects, right? So it's, for me, all those little thoughts continue and you know you say constraint but the essay cannot go on forever so i kind of want to it's like flying a plane <laughs> you take off you do a loop and you want to bring it back if you don't bring it back hopefully nothing bad happened <laughs> but anyways you know you want you want to bring it back to the and so many people start a thought or tell a story and then it kind of like ends nowhere and i say well is that it and we ask for the punchline, but it doesn't have to be a punchline. You just have to bring it all the way back. And that's why I read history books. Boom. End of the end of the thought. Yeah, I like I like the thought, the thought that it's a constraint. It's interesting. And you're making me think of I think it's a it's Joseph Conrad. It's not in Heart of Darkness. It's in a different story. Secret Share, maybe. It's the uh I I didn't mean it's basically like these guys are on a boat and all of a sudden there's a person swimming next to the boat. Are you familiar with this story? No, but maybe it's going to come back. <clears throat> Tell me. <clears throat> I have been haunted in all the best ways by this quote, quote for uh -huh. friggin' forever for 20 something years now, 20, 30 years. And it's basically, they're like, why are you swimming in the middle of the ocean or the sea or wherever they are? And they pull this person out of the water and they're like, you're basically the assumption is they were trying to commit suicide. Like there's no end to this. There's no way you end up where we found you. And the person, the response is I, I, I didn't swim to sink. Like this wasn't suicide. I merely was, uh, I, I figured I would swim until I sank and that's not the same thing. <laughs> well, okay. And it's this, this profound idea that we go out on these journeys sometimes just uh -huh. to figure out, cause you have to find those limits, right? Uh -huh. Like you have to find those constraints to make it interesting. The the unrolled snowball is not interesting. Just like going out and finding somebody else's. It's so fascinating to see where they put those parameters around the history lesson. But there are so many thoughts that I'm not in a position to finish just yet. You know, they, they popped in and uh -huh. I need to know more, ask more, maybe think more to, to close the loop. And, uh, well, the way I think about the essays, the essays are a great experiment for me and kind of a, a mental discipline. I write down things that pop in my head from nowhere. And you and I had a conversation about where ideas come from in general. And I feel like they float up in the, in the air. But you can, you can tune, tune in and catch them. Or you can just let them be and let them... I have this big overarching hypothesis that when the world is ready for an idea, somebody will catch it. You know, like the, the big ideas that we know, the invention of the radio, I think it's one of the more contested inventions who actually invented it. Because people had an idea <laughs> and, you know, patented it and then actually produced it. And I think there are a couple of names that float around. I'm, I'm, I'll let people do their research and go down that rabbit <laughs> hole who invented the radio. But I think once we are ready for something, and it could be a, a mundane, small idea, it doesn't have to be a, a revolutionary idea like the radio. If you don't catch it, somebody else will catch it, and they, they start popping up. And, and I see those moments where something comes to my mind, and I don't even know why, and then I write about it, but then I see two other people who don't necessarily follow what I write, write something very similar. So I feel like I don't know why it was on people's mind to write about it. And and these are not you know, earth-shattering ideas, but it's kind of funny when I see them pop up. But maybe because I'm also tuning in to all the sources and I notice that people are writing about it, maybe people, people were writing about it before, I'm just much more aware of some small idea. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating how minds work. 
you have to have a lot of yeah there's peace and quiet to be able to catch those little flying butterflies is that a positive or a negative in your mind that this this zeitgeist and <laughs> like three I of think. us can describe the same idea at the same time and it's a magical yeah thing. I think. do you ever feel robbed by that or is it like liberating mm -hmm. that we're all exploring the same thing circumstantially i think it's 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 magic in some way that it does happen and i have a sense of responsibility to at least write it down i don't know why but i feel like and I, I actually talked about it in the TED talk that you brought up, how ideas don't come to me when I sit at a desk in an office. They, they never really did. <laughs> it was on a walk, on a, just being out in nature. Usually when I'm in motion, something pops in my head and I have no idea. I wasn't even thinking about it. And I have now, now I have this discipline of writing it down, even if it's in an incomplete thought. I'll just write it down and I'll see where it takes me. Because the minute you write it down, you create this little container for it. So uh, other things, other examples. You other mean a constraint? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a mini a container. Sorry, go on. <laughs> a, a mini container that can get bigger. I mean, you never know. The things You start to collect those little things in there. It's like, oh, Matt said this. Oh, somebody wrote that. It actually explains a little bit of what I was trying to say. Or actually somebody gave me... I think that, the, you know, there's the language and there's the vocabulary. And sometimes the same word means different things. But having a conversation with somebody, and on the podcast I mentioned it a couple of times when I said to someone, you know, I learned a lot today, but first of all, you gave me a vocabulary to cover a certain piece of the universe that I, I don't think I fully covered before. And sometimes it's the use of words. I had Luca Delana on the show who, who writes about ergodicity and the idea of, you know, game overs in life and in business just very quickly he says that not the fastest skier wins the competition but the one that doesn't break a leg and participates and wins in all the you know 10 races and in investing it's such a powerful idea because people want to get rich fast and if you play the game over a long period of time and i like to think of investing as an infinite game a game with no end then one thing you definitely don't want to have is what luca calls a game over and I, I've known this intuitively for as long as I remember. And he, the way he presented it with the skier, I thought that that's exactly what I'm trying to say in the investment world. You want to be able to keep on showing up again and again and again. And the last thing you want to see is to see a complete wipeout in your portfolio where you have to start all over from zero. You know, Munger said many times the last thing he would ever want was to start all over from zero this the first, he said, you know, 100,000, whatever the amount is, is the hardest to save. So do everything you can yeah. to never start from zero. And I think it's a very powerful idea, even before you start thinking about seeing this stock go up five, 10 times. Sure, let's get excited about it. But first of all, what can we do not to ever start again from zero? In the great tradition of don't start from zero, yeah. but the evolutions along the way, I know you're a huge fan of the planting of a tree metaphor. Yes. But I also know you're a huge fan of a certain hundred year old oak desk. Uh huh. <laughs> those are two trees. They are. How do you reconcile those two things? This is my, not a gotcha moment. You know what I mean? How do you reconcile <laughs> the beauty of planting a tree for other generations to enjoy against your love for a very specific hundred plus year old desk? made of said wood from said trees. Right, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, if I had a choice, I would have had a desk made of, of you know, some other material. But anyways, I think the big picture is <laughs> <laughs> I, I planted trees as a kid and I got to see them grow. And I got to see how slow the process is and what a journey it is for a small, little, tiny seedling to become a tree. And I've seen those trees grow you know, many times taller than I am. And there's something powerful about it. And I tell a story of one particular tree that my great grandfather planted. And I think it was 1916, 1917. He was a teenager at the time. And with his high school, they planted a couple of trees and there's a little plaque next to that tree. And I walked past that tree and I learned to ride a bicycle next to it and, and 
multiple generations of the family. It's in a park. It's in a, in a little town. But the fact that the tree is still there, and in some way it's this physical connection over many generations of the tree that grew, there's something powerful in it. That, and I write about it in a big picture idea that I have this belief that there is a way to figure out that each generation doesn't have to start from scratch. And when you think about you how you talked about books, we don't start from scratch with every generation. We have books that were preserved and translated from Greek and Latin and everything else in between over thousands of years. And we were able to read what the Egyptians were putting in the tombs and the the poems and the stories and how similar they are really to what we think about life today. And uh, the fact that we were able to keep it and pass it on, this intellectual capital, even the idea of a story, you know, a play in the Greek times and today, a movie that wins uh, an Oscar, it's, it's all the same kind of storytelling that existed for thousands of years. So we don't start on an intellectual level from scratch. We don't, and one of my pieces I said, we don't burn all the books with every generation. I know it happened at some points in different parts of the world that people burn books. It's a hor horrible thing to imagine, but as a big picture, as a civilization, we have not done it. We kept on building on what was be before us. And hopefully what we're building today will help the next generations as well. But financially speaking, for so many people, people start every generation with zero. I had somebody on the podcast, we had this conversation, I asked him again about his childhood and upbringing, and he says the whole family was always talking about money. But at the end of the day, after all those decades, they had nothing to leave behind for the next generation. Right. So he says, why, why all this talk about money if you can't even leave uh, you know, anything? financially speaking, to the next generation. And I think it's, we talk about people living from paycheck to paycheck, not just in the U.S., I think it's happening around the world. But in terms of passing even the smallest capital to the next generation, it doesn't happen as often as we think. You know, people talk in aggregate, the large numbers, but it's very concentrated how few people actually are in a position to pass wealth on to the next generation. So maybe there is a formula, and in a lot of my writing, I try to find a way to explain how. If you think of yourself as an investor over a lifetime, and you have some capital that stays behind, and you have this infinite investment horizon, if you're doing the right thing over a long period of time, there will be some capital to be passed on. And, you know, the monger says, don't start, well, if you don't have to, don't, don't start from zero. Wouldn't it be nice if each, gener each generation started with, with something so they don't have to start from zero? And, and I don't even want to embark on the idea that you know, kids end up with big student loans these days and they actually don't even start at zero, but <laughs> they, they start off deep, deep below zero, which has a huge impact on the choices they make, the careers they embark on and everything else. So... To me, multi-generational wealth doesn't necessarily mean that you want to you know, turn billions into trillions, but a bigger picture of what is it that we can do to grow and preserve wealth over a lifetime and have something to pass on to the next generation. I think that that would be a really helpful gift and not only give peace and comfort to the families in their lifetime, but also the idea that the next generation has something to start with. And, uh, you know, you didn't ask me about my childhood upbringing, but I grew up in Poland, and Poland, speaking of location that I talk about in my book, Money, Life, Family, Poland did not prove to be the best location to... There you go, you have it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very personal book. When I wrote it, somebody asked me that it's I could... It's a very personal book. It's a beautiful it's a, book. It really thank, is. <laughs> thank you. Somebody that's much more, I feel like I am private, but the person I have in mind is very, very private. He read one of the early copies. Well, I actually was not even published yet. And he said, you know, it's, it's very personal. And I said, there were stories that I just wanted to have in that book. Because I see it as, I told Chris Mayer about it, how I see writing or a podcast as a flare into the sky. You send it out to the sky. And you don't know who's going to see it. But the people that will see it and respond, very cool things can happen. You know, so to hide it all and not share it, I don't think it would be fair. And that's, that's why 
I decided to put it. And I don't know where I was going with that thought. What was your earlier question? <laughs> Chris Mayer. Yes. Book plugs today. Oh, yes. That's he doesn't a... strike me as, I mean, this is a phenomenal book, by the way. You uh -huh. recommended this to me. You're holding the dear, dear fellow. This is the dear fellow time vendor. Uh, Bind yeah, binder, time binder. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Time amazing binder. book. Amazing um, book. I want to stay on the, the childhood thing and the things that we attach to that are not necessarily financial values that pass on. Yes. And I believe this is from the Money Life family book. Yes. You told the story about the about being on vacation with your dad and filling the mm -hmm. tank with $20 and something yes. he told you. Wow. Can you yes. tell that story? And uh -huh. that wasn't an inheritance, but that was a wisdom inheritance right there. Can you it was. break that down for me? It was. Well... Just to give some context to, to listeners that maybe are have not heard some pieces of the story before, but I was born in 1980 in Poland, and Poland for the first decade of my life was still under what I would call communism. People try to relabel those things these days, but basically it was a centrally planned economy. The government owned everything except for the smallest, tiniest businesses selling tomato and flowers. Everything else was owned by the government. So you worked for the government and there was an office in Warsaw that decided the volume, the quantity of various products from nails to airplanes and uh, locomotives and everything else. So it was a poorly managed economy, a fairly rich country, but a, a poorly managed economy to the point that it led to huge shortages in the 80s and just a bizarre outcome where Poland that uh, was invaded by all the powers around to steal pork and pig, uh, ran out of pork and pig in the 80s. So it's a huge embarrassment. The joke is that if you start communism in a desert in Sahara, they'll run out of sand. That's <laughs> 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 That was the joke. So, so ouch, ouch, communist burns. Oh, so, man. So Poland, that, that's, uh, you know, there's no shortage of pigs and never was. And the Swedes in 1600 knew that, and so did every other power that's the neighbor of Poland knew that. So you could invade and, and steal you know, flour, wheat, and you could steal meat. And somehow we had ration cards, which people misunderstand. So it wasn't food stamps like in the U.S. for people with low income. And the whole country, every single people, every single person had a ration card issued every month. So you would go to a government store, and these were the only stores available that had ounces or grams of flour, sugar, uh, milk, and uh, a couple of basic products, butter, I think, too, and meat, obviously. And so you could only buy that much. And if you had kids, you could, you could buy more milk. And the government store would not sell you more. You could buy directly from the farmer, <laughs> but you couldn't buy more in the store. So the whole country, everybody had to uh, pick up those cards and I, I used to walk with my grandpa to pick up those cards and uh, you know, I mentioned in, in the book and a couple of stories how it was an event of the month for me because grandpa would tell me stories and I didn't make much of it I thought all the kids in the entire world go to this office in their town and pick up a ration card you know I thought Matt there in Pennsylvania or wherever you were at the time <laughs> you were yeah, going to an yeah. office and, and picking up those cards with, with your grandpa or grandma or dad or whoever that was my image, and, and I realized that wasn't true. But anyways, you asked me about a specific story. My dad, gas station, Austria, and Poland just opened up, so I was maybe 8, 9, 10 at the time. And my dad is a big you know, traveler, so we would dra travel around Poland as a kid to the lakes, to the mountains. Poland is a, not a big country, but has beautiful landscapes from very flat to mountainous and, and some of the coast, Baltic Sea. But anyways, when the country opened up, we obviously went to the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia. It was Czechoslovakia at the time. And then we went to Austria. But there was this one trip that we organized, and it was actually coincided with my 10th birthday in the summer, 1990. And we drove to Greece. So uh, we took our little Fiat. It was Fiat 126P, if people want to look it up, the tiniest little thing. <laughs> That's more a car that you go to <laughs> to start to pick up two baguettes. But if you want three baguettes, you need to take the other car. <laughs> For all the French-speaking listeners, in terms of the size of the car. 
But anyways, we drove that car with a tiny little uh, trailer, but not the one that you sleep in. You want, it was a tiny trailer where you could s store some luggage and, uh, I don't know, a, a tent we had and uh, sleeping bags. So it was a low, low, low cost trip. But for me at 10, this was the trip of a lifetime. We were crossing borders. I got to see the big uh, lake in Hungary and then the coast of Croatia. It was minutes before the conflict in, uh, in, um, you know, in Yugoslavia on the, uh, in the Balkans. And you could already yeah. feel the tensions in some of the places as we drove through. So we made it to Greece. On the way back, uh, we were running low on, on dollars. So I have to explain that as Poland was going through this massive transformation in the 80s to the 90s, the currency was held at a, a ridiculous exchange rate. So my dad, in dollar terms in the 80s, was making about $20 per month. But the purchasing power of the currency was sufficient, so we had a decent life. Just if you wanted to take the money out of the country, it would become $20. So it was meaningless if you went to Austria, if you went to Germany with $20. It wasn't the $20 that it is today. I don't know if it was the equivalent of whatever it is with inflation, 60, 70, I don't know. But anyways... Uh, it wasn't a substantial amount. So buying gas for this little car meant that my dad, and I remember vividly how he told me, I'm putting my month's salary as a physician, as a doctor, as somebody saving people's lives into the tank of this micro car so that we can make it back <laughs> to Poland. And uh, those dollars were extremely precious. You couldn't get them very easily at the time. And and I had this vivid, vivid image of what a big purchase it is. And, uh, you know, how the meter is running at the gas station. He was looking at it, how, you know, this is two weeks, oh. three weeks, four weeks. <laughs> there goes my salary. Yeah. Well, imagine that with whatever salary you're making right now. And you can see that your entire salary is going into the tank. So this was an early lesson in so many different things, economics, but also big picture politics how they affect every single person all the way to a kid standing with his dad, filling up a tank in a, at a random gas station somewhere outside of Vienna, Austria. And I think it took me another few decades and few degrees and a lot of study time to understand what really happened. Why did it work that way? And what followed was an incredible decade, the 90s in Poland of change, free market coming in, the stock exchange reopening, foreign investments, supermarkets. I mean, everything just boomed, but it also led to huge hyperinflation and very high unemployment as a side effect. So, you know, it wasn't all beautiful to look at, but uh, amazing lessons and things that I've, a lot of my colleagues have read about in the books, I actually saw it. And, you know, hyperinflation is something that you can't explain it kind of reminds me of the, the scene where people are climbing a very tall mountain and they realize oh wow i need oxygen to breathe right so you live all your life at your current altitude you don't even care but there's a moment where you realize i can't catch another breath i need oxygen from a tank and hyperinflation is that kind of phenomenon for the economy and the households where you panic and you run out and spend every single not a dollar it was a zloty that you have in the house because it's losing value so quickly that you know that you're going to get half and half and half and less and less and less for it as the months uh, fly by. So it's, it's such a scary thought that you're working, you're earning, but the money is losing value at such a fast pace. And there are a few places on earth that experienced it and people nod when I talk to them. You know, Argentina, Asia, other people experience yeah. it too, but hyperinflation it's such a scary thought and such a disruptive force a point came up in your conversation with david mccraney mm -hmm. where you're talking about controlling emotions relative uh, being more important than being intelligent basically right like or understanding your emotions is mm -hmm. is a precursor to actually intelligent actions and I'm thinking of this in terms of your dad and filling the tank with a month's physician's salary. Yes. Which, please let that hit you as hard as that sentence hit me when I came across it in your book, because my God, there's an emotional control. There's an emotional constraint. 
yeah. on your dad to choose to make that investment in that moment in in that whole trip. He's mm-hmm. passing a different type of value on so many levels in making that trip with you. And in, in that, how how do you contextualize that choice that he made? Can can you see yourself in his shoes? Do you? Mm-hmm. How do you understand his choice to do that whole thing? That's a great question. Um, I think the way he looked at it was, you know, life is about experiences. Money comes and goes. And and I grew up in a hmm. fairly you know, frugal household with a lot of principles that helped me both from my parents and grandparents. But I think experiences count. So as soon as we were in a position to go somewhere, even with a tent to the lake uh, area in Poland, we would go. And uh, seeing more of the world was important to him. When he was in high school, he went on a trip to Bulgaria and Romania with his friends, and they took trains and buses and spend the nights in, in, I don't know, somewhere in villages and people would bring them food and cut up a watermelon and bring them. I don't know. He, he tells all those stories. So it was very important for him to go see the world. And uh, as soon as we could, we did. We, we tried to see the world. And I have to explain and, and maybe share even more background. There are certain things that people take for, for granted. Uh, for example, the fact that you can go and have a get a passport and have a passport in your house and travel anytime you want. U.S. is such a big country that you can you know, travel and never need a passport, but Europe is tiny, so you need a passport to travel. Until 1990, in Poland, you couldn't have a passport at home, so you had to petition for one, and there were two different passports. There was one passport for the Eastern Bloc, so the communist, uh, communist countries, uh, yeah, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, East Germany, Russia had its own rule. Soviet Union, if you had to go to Soviet Union, they didn't want you really to go see how bad it is. So you had to be invited. But you could travel around the bloc, which for us meant Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania. Yugoslavia was a bit different. But uh, yeah, but if you wanted to go to Germany, as in West Germany, people forget there were two Germanies at the time, or France or London, you needed a different passport. And there were two limitations. One was that the country, Poland, would not give it to you. And second, the other country would not let you in. You needed a, a visa to each and every country until 1990. So if they let you go, the, you would have to return the ticket when you came back. Oh, sorry, the passport. So you were gone 10 days, and you had to report back and give the passport back. So there were huge limitations. So in 1990, things opened up. You could get a passport for the whole world. And the whole world was dropping visas, so we could actually travel without a visa very quickly. So if my dad was just trying to take advantage of it as much as we could. And even if our budget was extremely limited at the time, we would go and, and travel and see the world. So that's how he, he looked at it, that money spent that way meant something. But also, you know, the, uh, the currency... To me, the dollar was gold. Like people think of how do you store value? You know, we talk about preservation. But at the time, if you had any savings, you would buy the dollar and you would hold your savings in the dollar. And then spending that dollar to travel, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big de- decision. But I think to him, the experience of being able to see the world mattered so much more. And it, it changed very, very quickly. You know, income started to adjust, borders opened up. But, you know, when you're experiencing it, it's it's moving at a glacier pace because you don't know how quickly it will move. So I remember that this was the very first moment where he did the math and he thought we could afford to bring everything with us and just stay in a tent and see a lot of the world all the way to Greece, which is a long drive. I think the drive from Poland to Greece is about the same as from Maine or Boston to, to Florida to Miami. So it's a very long drive in a tiny little car. In a very <laughs> small car. In a very small car. Just a couple of baguettes rolling yes. down the countryside. Th- this car yeah. couldn't make it up the mountains in Croatia. The roads along the coast of Croatia are oh. beautiful. But the, this car, I think, had 25 horsepower from what I remember. So it, would, it was prob- probably like a big lawnmower <laughs> yeah. that you sit on. <laughs> and uh, anyways, we, we made it. and. But, you know, those memories are priceless. And when I think of, and I had a conversation with somebody how, well, bigger picture, you know, I'm I'm reading Ken Honda's Happy Money these days. 
and I'm thinking that money, it's a means to an end. You know, it has an importance and meaning, and I like to know the context for my clients, what that money means to them. But it's, it's meant to serve a certain purpose, and, and I think you know, travel is one of those things that leave and pay lifelong dividends. I think somebody used that term. I, I think the, the author of Die With Zero said how experiences pay dividends throughout the, your lifetime. Yeah. So I think that, that 20 bucks that went into that tank, first of all, I think it inspired an, a, a huge curiosity in me in figuring out how, how the world actually works and how come some countries figured it out and the other ones cannot. And to me, it's mind-blowing, you know, Poland today, and I walk around and I visit regularly, I honestly don't recognize it. And my wife is from Chicago, and I took her to Poland a couple of times, and I tell her, you know, in my head I have those images of Poland from different points in time. And when I walk around Poland today with Starbucks and supermarkets, and a lot of them are owned <laughs> by uh, big U.S. Um, you know, mall uh, real estate REITs and, and so on, and I remember those street corners where there was absolutely nothing. It was gray and it was, you know, dark. But as a kid, I didn't see it. You know, how would I put it? I, I didn't see I'm missing out on something. You know, it's, it's funny because you, if you don't have anything to compare it with, I, I didn't see that I'm missing out on anything until I went to Vienna, Austria, and it, it blew my mind that there's a world that's so different than, than Poland. And anyways, I mean, there's so many people that were born in Poland with no recollection of that last decade of the failed experiment. They have no idea what I'm talking about. I actually had some kids like that approach me. I say kids, you know, I'm 43, so they, they might be 30. And they say, do you remember that time? Do you remember that time? And I say, I, I actually do remember that time. And they ask me as if I was a grandpa, telling them about a, a story. <laughs> Somebody wrote a book, The Country from the Moon, about Poland from the 80s. And it wasn't just Poland, you know, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia at the time, Hungary, they had a similar experience. But it's something that you can't explain. And I think it's so important to know what kind of an economic and political system there is in the country where you choose to live. And it all doesn't matter until it does. And when it does, you don't want to be that kid standing at a gas station waiting to fill up with 20 bucks the whole tank of a tiny little car. You realize that there maybe is a better way to organize the world. That's how I looked at it. Well, you don't want, you don't want the same for the, for the next generation, for the kids. No, no. But there's no way you're the same person without these experiences. That's true. You know, I was thinking about it. I, I have this... And I always had this mindset of abundance. I never had a mindset of a shortage mm -hmm. of anything. And uh, at a conference not long ago, I was talking to somebody, and he volunteers to teach at a school. But he said something, so he, he's in the investment business, and, but he said something that really struck a chord with me. He said it, and I want to say it exactly the way he said it. He said it, I've, I've never gone hungry in my life. And uh, it, it's, it's somebody from North America, broadly speaking. And, uh, and I said, well, tell me more what it means to you. He says, there was no time in my life when I went hungry. And I thought to myself, there was no time in my life that I went hungry. You know, Poland was a, a bizarre experiment at the time, but I never went hungry. I have no, no memory of that. My, my grandparents' generation that lived through World War II and true, true shortages and you know conflict going on and uh, nazi occupation and so on they do have memories of days when there was no food for dinner yeah. but i have and, and my parents generation doesn't they don't have that memory at all which is a powerful powerful revelation and i think you know poverty as a concept it's really interesting because it's not statistical as they want to make it i had a professor in paris who told me you know you're poor if you're living under two dollars a day <laughs> and me being me, I said, uh, sir, I, I lived under $2 a day, at least given the official you know, currency exchange <laughs> when I was a kid. He says, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, no, sir, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, my dad was making 20 bucks according to the official <laughs> exchange rate per month. And it worked because the, the purchasing power of the local currency and local products 
was good enough. I'm not praising the time, just on a relative basis, was good enough for us to have, you know, housing, food, and a tiny car. So, and obviously I had issues with this professor, and he tried to fail me after that. But I learned that voicing your opinion sometimes. <laughs> 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 but but it's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating how, you know, you don't know what I know, and you don't know my experience, which is something that you know, I grew to respect. I will never, I can hear your story, but I didn't li live your story. So the professor could have given me a chance to share my experience instead of telling me what it feels like to live under $2. I was somebody that never lived under $2. Per day did did you pass the class <laughs> did you get a I did grade? I did they gave me a break but you know it's I think it's a bigger picture for me education and going to school was a fascinating experience especially college so college uh, I went to a, a really good school in Poland that I still have memories of taking the exam to get in and it was just a lot of a lot of work and a huge stress I felt like it's <laughs> It was one of the hardest things I had to do. But anyways, the kids that made it in over that huge hurdle were incredible. You know, they were from all over the country, really smart. They spoke languages. They, they were very motivated. And then two years into that school, I went to Brussels as an exchange student where I picked up one up on Wall Street at a random English language bookstore that I mentioned in my TED Talk. But it was also eye-opening to study with kids from around Europe and we had uh, Spaniards, Italians, Brits, Irish, uh, Danish, I don't know, from all over. And it was really fun to realize how much we have in common. And then, uh, you know, the next school, I went to grad school in Paris, and then that school had a global student body. We had students from all over. And, and Every time I wanted to get as much as possible out of those schools. And to me, asking questions was the recipe. And I, I realized that my questions sometimes might have been disruptive. And But I thought, if I don't know the answer now, and I leave the school, who will ever give me the answer? So <laughs> I felt this enormous pressure <laughs> to ask the questions. And in, in Paris, with all my questions, uh, some of the French students asked me if I want to run uh, for um, it was an office available to students. It was uh, Conseil de Direction. It was like the board of the school with the professors and the um, all kinds of you know prominent French uh, individuals from the business and politics and a couple of students. And the students were supposed to represent the voices of all the students. So I got elected, if I remember correctly, as the first non-French representative to that body so I was sitting there <laughs> and my my French was much better than it is today much more fluent although I, I still speak it and I was asking all those different questions and somehow they positioned us so I was sitting right in front of the the dean of the school face like one-on-one <laughs> -on -one, eye to eye and I would ask him questions like what the students would ask me you know, to, to ask about the, the library hours and for example, we had one third of the students were foreign students, and after the graduation, we would all fly home. And the, the diploma, the school said you have to come back for the diploma in person. And we had students from South America and Asia and Africa and the U.S. and Canada and Mexico, everywhere. So the students told me, you know, it's a big problem for us because when we're done, we fly to Colombia. And when are we going to pick up the paper diploma? So I petitioned so that the school uh, allowed you to leave a letter um, authorizing the school to mail it to you. And they, they passed it through. So I don't know if they still do it. I hope they do. But that was my little... <laughs> but there's a whole class of <laughs> Bogomil graduates yes. walking around the world today. And they don't even know. Because they got that piece of mail. And they, they don't they, even know. They don't even know that it was me that, that asked for it. So no. Funny experiences. But anyways, all this to say, I did ask a lot of difficult questions, and I did realize that yeah. not all the professors are open to a discussion. And I mean, it's a long story short. But Why do you think that is? Why, why do I you think, think that is? I'm I interrupting think, you. No, no, I, I love the question. So I, in Paris, I had two kinds of professors. So the school, it's Sciences Po, which issued all the, the French presidents and the many directors of the IMF and the World Bank and all those big institutions and EU commissioners and and God knows what. 
and um, and the the UN um, leadership as well. So there was a big focus on on the political side. But then the, the school for many years was opening up to business. So my professors came from two different worlds. One was very traditional political science, uh, by the book, and never worked in the private sector. And the private sector usually is the enemy. That was the belief. And then I had mm. much younger professors that came from business. They worked in all kinds of roles, you know, investment banking, marketing, everything. And they would come back from New York or London or Singapore or around the world and would want to share what they learned. And I, I really liked those courses because they were closer to the real life and they had such you know, fresh experience and they came back to Paris to start their own firms or join different firms and they wanted to give back. So I was going from professors that would enjoy me being curious and then I was going to other classes where unknowingly I would get punished for asking the wrong question. And sometimes the professor would say, you know, I know what kind of question you're going to ask. <laughs> I said, like, how do you know? <laughs> oh, we know. <laughs> uh, and you I come by the teacher's lounge. We have right. a whole list of your questions going. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, but maybe that's, you know, we asked about the, podcast and I'm thinking I think I just like asking questions because that's how I learn that's how I process information that's how I get somewhere you know I sit down with a client or a prospect and I, I met a few people only last few weeks and you know I sometimes spend two hours getting to know somebody and I realize I'm getting this big context in what am I what am I how can I help you know how can I serve better and asking questions in life gives you so much more context. I wrote this article, you know, one more question, one extra question, how, and, and I, I, I made it, you know, amusing how I was in a meeting and, and usually this last question that pops in your head when you're ready to leave, that's the most valuable question. You know, I was in meetings with different managements of companies over the years. And when you're ready to leave and you feel like, uh, there's this one more thing. And that one more thing usually <laughs> has like 80% weight. But it's because I asked the other ones and I realized I'm seeing a gap and I'm seeing something that's not fitting right. And I just want to know. And I think it's been a, a huge uh, lifesaver in many ways, in financially speaking, and not only to be able to ask that one more question and having the audacity to ask that question, even if, I will get silent. Sometimes the silence speaks more than uh, a nicely polished uh, answer. But just have the audacity to ask that question. Don't don't be obnoxious. That's not what I'm saying. Just if you have a question, ask that question because I, I might have not thought of it. And yeah, so my my schooling has not removed that <laughs> aspect of me. If anything. I cultivated it and, and I got smarter about it and I realized some people don't don't want me sure. to ask. I'm remiss if we run out of time and don't get to talk a little no, bit about let's do it. Let's investing. Do it. Yeah. And I think I, I have at least I'm gonna try to keep myself to a limit here on a couple of things with this. You talked about and I think you've written about this in a couple of different places. I won't hold you on the spot to what the, I think it was like the three qualities of a good business are. If you remember yeah. that, you can tell us. If not, no, no, sure. sorry. It was the qualities of a good business. Uh -huh. But I think I'm really curious in the extra monger, the inversion of that. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about these two professor types. I'm not saying they were bad professors, but when no. I think about investments, when I think about ways that value is passed on or pays us a dividend or transcends lines, what are qualities of a bad investment? What are, what are the avoid at all costs lists for Bogomil? Oh, yeah, so so I tried to make it simple and I keep a list of all the stocks I ever looked at and, and it's a way for me to, to remember. And stocks even that I looked at just to to have an idea and kind of a running list of different businesses that I looked at. But I noticed that there are three sources of trouble. It's a... Uh, too much debt, 
secular decline and questionable management. And and I think almost anything you can think of kind of fits in all all three. Sometimes it's all three happening at the same time. And I'll explain. So too much debt makes you look like a hero when things are going well. Because leverage in a margin account or if you have a business with a tiny bit of equity and the rest is debt makes you look like a hero when things are good. Your, your returns look great and, and everything looks beautiful. When things are not going your way, which may happen if you're in the business long enough, you could lose the business. You know, the companies go bankrupt. People forget that a business with no debt, not a fraud, <laughs> cannot go <laughs> out of business until the last customer decides they don't want your service or good. It's a very powerful idea. But you might have customers that want what you have and, and all is great and it's not a fraud, but you have a lot of debt. There might be a hiccup. Obviously, the pandemic was a massive hiccup for so many businesses where you're not in a position to collect revenue for a couple of months. You're not in a position to pay interest on the debt. You might not be able to survive and keep the business. The equity gets wiped out. So that's something that is a source of trouble. Secular decline, it's a tricky place, especially for value investors. So I call myself a value buyer, but a growth holder. I want to get a bargain. I want to get a deal. I want to get something at a discount. And I don't know if it's my grandma that taught me that, you know, walking around a market and showing me groceries that you can get a better value for a lower price. Like the concept of value and price was always with me. So when I started reading Buffett and Munger, I realized, oh, it's just my grandma's concept taken to a whole different level. <laughs> and somehow we keep those two worlds separate, you know, grocery shopping and in stock shopping. You know, we're going to go buy, get a deal at Costco, but then we want to buy a stock. We buy the stock at the all-time high and the stock that everybody loves and somebody just wrote about on, on their blog or in their YouTube video. I don't know why we can't connect that. You need to get a deal first. And then, if it's a successful business, you want to hold it as long as possible. We can talk more about it. Secular decline is a tricky place because a value shopper sees a cheaper and cheaper stock. Whether it's a price valuation, they look at it and it's like, oh, it's dropping and it's getting cheaper. And But it's looking backwards because you look at even the multiple and you realize, oh, they used to make a dollar per share per year. Well, what if they make 50 cents? Is it still that cheap? And the trouble is that I think that the change and in innovation has accelerated to the point that we really have to pay attention which businesses will stick around. I've seen a lot of studies, and I have this number of you know, 20 years in mind. When you look at the, the glory years of a business, they are around for 100 years, some of them, that's true. But the peak, peak value creation, when they really made big leaps, on average, it's somewhere between 18 to 20 years. So it's, it's an interesting idea that when you look at a business, and it doesn't mean that every single business will have 18 years. Some might have just five of those. And some may never really get there. But I think paying attention that you're not dealing with a secular decline for the particular business or an industry, it's very important. Because you might get something that gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. The questionable management, you know, they're obviously out, outright frauds, right? They lie to you and they'll, they're, they're criminals. But then there's a whole range of people like that, and at the other end, let's put Warren Buffett, that is treating every shareholder as if it was you know, their, his sister. And he, very frank, very honest you know, disclosure, and just a, a level of integrity that I think we all could aspire to. But you have a wide range in between. And if you have people that overpromise and deliver, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> maybe not everything looks right. You know, it's it's interesting because you think that investing is a business where it's all about numbers and spreadsheets and, and a formula. And and I love numbers. I think numbers give me comfort, but I grew to appreciate how much of what I do is people, and people is, um, it means emotions. And you mentioned David McCraney that I had a fascinating conversation about emotions, how emotions help us decide in life. But... All this to say, when you look at an investment, when you look at the two sides of what I do, is on one hand, I have, I'm responsible for other people's money. On the other hand, I'm entrusting that capital to different businesses that are operated and managed by people. I want to know that the people that are running those businesses are people that I want to be 
in business with. And I've been in meetings where, and I have one vivid memory, and I won't mention the name of the company, <laughs> where the numbers look great, uh, everything looked beautiful. And this, this company actually was about to be written up by a major newspaper, and uh, they, were, they wanted to share praises of this company. And I've been doing research at the time. I was doing research on that company for a while, and I got to see the CEO in New York, and, and I was in the meeting, and I, I asked all the questions I had, and I lingered, and I, I stayed. And I, I just felt that it doesn't make sense. There's something that I'm not seeing, but it's not adding up. And I came back from the meeting, and I, I couldn't explain and sometimes it's, I think, this accumulated experience of seeing so many different case studies in your head. And we spoke briefly before we started recording, this kind of your second brain that gives you the answer before your, your first brain, whatever you want to call it, the, the one, the more immediate one, will give you the, the rationale behind what you're thinking. But I just didn't trust the guy. And the simplest way to explain, I said, I wouldn't leave my wallet with this person. I wouldn't. Why would I buy shares of this company? It doesn't matter who says what. It doesn't matter where they're featured. So a few years down the road, he got fired. They restated uh, years and years of financial reporting. And uh, they, were, they were tweaking things and making it look better than they were. And, and obviously, the stock you know, collapsed. And it was a very painful experience. And this company almost went bankrupt at some point. But anyways... There are moments where you have to appreciate that feeling. And that feeling, it's, it's based on years and years of experience. I spoke with a very seasoned investor that I have a lot of respect for, a very private person. And he really surprised me in a, in a conversation we had not long ago, because I see him as a very rational. David McCranny and I had this conversation about rational, very rational. Yeah. But he said, Bogomil, at the end of the day, and I was pondering some decision at the time that mattered to me, he said, ask yourself, how does it feel? And I was so caught off guard because I didn't expect him to invite me to lean on the emotional side to it. He says, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. If it feels right, do it. And he didn't say, no, it has to be that metric or this metric or this number. No, he said, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. And I think... It's very important both, you know, accepting new clients and accepting new investments in the portfolio. Do the research, of course. Do all the reading. Ask all the questions. But on some level, if it doesn't feel right, something somewhere, years of experience is telling you. And you don't have to know precisely what it is. It will come out eventually. But you don't have to know it in the moment. And I just like the idea of giving that part of you a chance to speak up. Just listen. Uh, it, that's a beautiful way to put it. That's a really, and so important. And I'll encourage, if you haven't heard the David McCraney episode, <clears throat> it's a good gets one. into that on a whole other level. It's a, good it's one. a really, really good one. He's one he, of my favorite people. He so talks excited. about genius, and I don't want to steal your next question, but he talks about genius. Please. And I've been thinking about genius a lot. And he explained it to me. He's doing some research that I think will turn into a book. But he said that in the simplest terms, and I'm paraphrasing, and I invite everybody to listen to that Talking Billions episode, but he says, you know, genius in terms of a high IQ is somebody that you put a, a board game in front of them. They never played this game before. You explain the rules to them, and they get the rules the fastest. They just get them, you know, I don't know, in seconds. Or you read to them the rules, and they just know it, and they can play. And, and it really made me pause and think, because I said to him, just because somebody gets the rules doesn't mean that they will stay and play, that they will play nice, that they will have the motivation to continue to play. There's so much more to it. And I'm, I'm extrapolating this to the you know, game of life, if you want to call it a game, or a game of investing. Right? I, I know a lot of brilliant people who will you know, figure out the balance sheet the fastest. Like They, they just have... I, I don't know. That's power. Like they'll see I hate through it. Those people. It's so <laughs> I, impressive. I, I, love, I, I love seeing it. It's 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 a miracle. They have footnotes and this and that, and they, they know the pension and this is misstated and this is too much and this is too little. It's like, 
But that doesn't mean that it's enough to show up day after day, look at stocks that are interesting and look at stocks that are boring, have the filter, have the practice, have the persistence and the commitment to go through it. And I think the hardest part is to actually go in. You did all the work and the market still tells you for a long period of time that you're wrong. The stock goes nowhere or it's down 50%. I think there's so much right. more to the game than figuring out uh, just the, 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 the rules of the, the board game. You know, Are you going to show up? Are you going to play? How long are you going to play? Will you have the motivation to play? And that goes back to what we started with, You know, the bigger why. Why do you even play? So if the game is called, as Buffett calls it, you know, running, pushing the snowball down the, the tallest mountain that has the longest runway because the snowball collects more and more snow. Sure, but why are you doing it, right? Like if you don't have a good why, yeah. eventually you'll, you'll drop out. It's a whole other topic, but in the investment world, I see that there are at least two kinds of investors. The ones that have an eight to 12 year incredible track record and they stepped away and then the ones that are doing it over a lifetime. Managing family money the way I do, I see it as a, a lifetime kind of pursuit. I would never want to put them in a position where I say, hey, I've been doing it for you know, that many years. Uh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> but uh, you know, people close funds and return capital because they don't want to undermine the incredible record that they had. I think they realize a couple of things. One, there's a burnout. I know that Peter Lynch worked really, really hard to sift through so many stocks yeah. and he had his analysts oh, and yeah. all that, but he was actually doing a lot of a lot of the leg work. And Nick Sleep had somebody else that had the incredible work. But I think also everybody eventually grows to appreciate that there was something unique about the period they were in that helped them even more so achieve the results. Huge credit to them, of course, but also, you know, I, I look at my own results. You know, there are times when Things are working in my favor, and there are times where I did all the work, and I'm not seeing the results for a long period of time. So we all accept that there are periods when everything is going in the perfect direction. And if you had, you know, if your goal is to have an absolute best short-term or limited-term return, yeah, there's a motivation to say, "Hey, I'm I'm done. I'm going to go collect stamps or play with my dog, and move on to something <laughs> else." And then, you know, I I think it's a choice, but. Uh, I think there's something remarkable in what, for example, Ian Buffett has done decade after decade. His enthusiasm for it is unwavering. I mean, I saw him in person in action in the last annual meeting, and I'm blown away how, man, I mean, you've been doing this for how long? Eight decades? And, and he's still excited about it. You know, he still wants to look at the next business and figure out the next thing, and, and he's still in it. So is... Variation on your normal closing question <clears throat> is, is success always a function of how well you understand your why? I think yeah, I like to ask people about success because I, I don't have the perfect answer myself. So I keep searching, but to me, it's a journey. And I feel that what I love about my life is that I wake up in the morning and I have something to be excited about in the day. Today, it's my recording with Matt. And it's Valentine's Day, so Megan and I will celebrate, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have our own highlight of the day together. But something that I'm intrigued about, something that I'm curious about, I'm falling asleep with a couple of books that I started reading and I wake up with ideas of things I want to write about or questions I want to ask or people I want to talk to. So I think for me it's important to be able to wake up every day with this appetite for what's ahead. And I like to fall asleep with a clear mind that it was a good day. I have nothing to worry about. And it translates to all aspects of my life. I, I tell people how when I think of investing, peace of mind... <laughs> And quality of sleep, it's a great test. And quality if, of sleep is a great test. If, if you are doing something or if you have something in the portfolio that keeps you up at night, I think the best thing you can do is sell it. Sell it. Just there are so many other things you could own. But I, I think it takes discipline and it's an, a very powerful filter. And you know the fear of missing out, whatever it is, might get in the way. 
But if you treat this as a lifelong pursuit and you realize that the quality of sleep at the end of the day really matters to you, there are some deals you don't want to be a part of. There are some management meetings you're going to walk out from and hold a tighter grip on your wallet and realize you don't want to do business with <laughs> whoever was in the room. And yeah, so, so start the day with this huge excitement for what's ahead and fall asleep feeling, this was a really good day. I, I had a good time. I made use of this day and, and I have nothing to worry about and I can just fall asleep. I think between those two, yeah, I feel really good about what's ahead. I, I love this idea of uh, you, you sleeping like a baby. It makes me very happy to know. <laughs> I do. I do. And it's it's an ongoing practice and it's a discipline. And, you know, I think there's this idea of saying yes and no in life. And I want to say yes to as many things. And I don't want to start a whole new topic, but, you know, there's this 80-20 rule. And I was thinking about it the other day, how you never really know. You know, the idea is that, you know, 20% of the effort or 20% of the, the, the the seeds or peas, whatever, you know, grow 80% of the, produce 80% of the results. But you don't really know in life, in practice, which one is the 20, which one is the 80. You and never know. You never know. Such an important lesson that you don't know. <laughs> Even when you, you know, you, let's, let's make it a, a very simple example. You have a portfolio, let's say 50 stocks or whatever, at 25. And you look at them and you have a sense of which ones you put in more work in, which ones you feel more comfortable holding, which ones have a bigger promise, and on and on and on. But then when you look back, and when you're really honest with yourself, I was actually looking at a, a late client's portfolio. I'm managing money for the, the kids now, for the next generation. And I realized how there is this core of the portfolio that did all the heavy lifting, you know, 20-some stocks that have really gone up the, the most. And if I'm honest with myself, some of them I had a feeling they'll be the ones, like the Chris Mayer's 100X. I don't think there were any 100X, yeah. but there were there were some really big, big performers. And obviously some stocks that went nowhere or went down, of course, but the, the ones that carried the weight, if I was really honest with myself, I don't know if I knew that these will be the 20. So. I think it's a, it's an interesting balance when you say no to things to think of maybe among them are some of those 100x ideas maybe it's a 5 minute conversation with somebody I have this practice if somebody reaches out to me and wants to talk I I want to give them at least a, a really you know good email answer to the questions they had and if I can I do my best I'll have a few minute call with them because sometimes I realize, and people have done it for me, that a five-minute conversation can have a huge impact on people's life. And in those five minutes, you can course correct or maybe get a new inspiration. So if I can be that in somebody's life, I don't want to say no. But that's something that I'm, I'm, I continue to practice, how much I can make myself available and where I can do even, you know, the the most, the least, right? So if I can write a proper email answer, I think, and people share incredible stories with me, you know, they're alive and, and because of a podcast, because of an article. So I think I owe them something and I always want to say that I, I read it and I'll, I'll answer even if it's a short answer. This is my quick thought on the 80-20. You never know what kind of an impact you have on the world. I love that so much. I think that's a perfect place for us to end this because you're inviting people to send you those emails and have those conversations, which I know you do. I think it's even in the I intro do. to the podcast. You do. you respond personally. I do. That's I how do. we started talking. <laughs> exactly. I can, think cool things can happen. Very cool things can happen. Can I, can I offer you a quick summary of this conversation Tell in me. gratitude yes. to you? Oh, okay. Please. I want to just... For the people just getting to know you, now that you're on this side of this, this is this is why. And this is what a normal conversation with Bogomil goes like, just for the record. <laughs> I go away with six new things, either to read, look about, or I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night thinking of. So some of the stuff we talked about from my notes that I took here. First off, I made a mo note right when we started that I think you're basically Polish Batman. You're, uh, you know, in Gotham fighting crime, doing business oh, by day. It's this, this amazing combination. We, 
We talked about constraint. You started us with that story of you and your wife on the beach before the TEDx talk mm -hmm. and the connection of people seeing you and how, how you kind of love the creative constraint around these formats. Uh -huh. and, I, and I don't know if you realized you said it, but you went into the language of self and the words that we use to describe, to language our lives uh -huh. as constraints. Speaking of treasures within things, you said that the treasure, treasure trove, treasure chest in early life and asking the questions that you always ask about, where does this start for you? Uh -huh. That's the treasure of where the, the true why is hidden. Man, it's like you knew you were going to land there at the end. This is amazing. <laughs> we talked about the rapid fire questions and the past lessons. It's so interesting because as you're talking about that, I made this little note to myself about like, this is your books. Uh -huh. Your books are these like quick ideas that then turn into lessons that then you capture. And then those, those thoughts start as the snowball at the top of the mountain for you. And then you roll them down. The, the only constraint there is that you do the activity to make these things. This idea of the tree your grandfather planted, that's still there. I feel like I need to go see this tree someday now. <laughs> that each generation doesn't start from scratch. And again, it's these ideas like the tree is a constraint. And holy crap, nobody knocked that tree down. It's still no, there. No, that's it's still there. That alone, that's mm -hmm. a success. That is a successful investment that that tree is still there. We went through the eighties and your history with your childhood, the constraint of communism, the constraint of the costs, your dad in Austria with the car, filling the tank on a month's salary. And I could just the constraint of the wisdom embodied in a, in a $20 thing. I've got a question now. Is there such a thing as a Bulgarian watermelon? Apparently. <laughs> I want to say it was Romania or Bulgaria. One of them had, had watermelons. And I remember those stories of people bringing my dad and his friends watermelons in the evening because they, they, they were backpacking and I would have to look it up and ask. I don't remember. Oh yes. my God. I'm so interested now. I need to eat a <laughs> Bulgarian watermelon before I die. Uh, <laughs> not having nothing to compare to means you don't know what you're missing out on because all of the opportunity is only over there when you seize it, but you have to see it before you can seize it. True. Asking too many questions. This is like the premise of your podcast is you're here to basically <laughs> a recipe for disruption is a recipe to learn, to live, to experience things. You, you told us about the two kinds of professors. You told us about you for student government, which was just hysterical and adorable. I want to make, I want to make eighties Polish back to school. And instead of Rodney Dangerfield, we're going to send you back in a time machine. Oh no, you're going to do this. You. <laughs> uh, I have to share this. I put this in the notes too for myself. I, I, you know, the expression, the world is your oyster. Uh huh. It is. I love this expression of me mishearing this uh -huh. and thinking the world is your toy store. <laughs> That's true too. I was like, what's That's so exciting too. about one stupid little thing inside of a fish in the ocean, you know, inside of these shells, wouldn't you want the world to be a toy store? That sounds so much better. The thought about a business with no debt. And uh -huh. even if it's not a fraud, it's not dead until the last customer doesn't show up. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say that before. <laughs> and that might be one of the greatest things ever. Future conversation, we'll just talk about like Jay Hughes and maybe emotional debts and all the other types yes. of debts that that plays into. Yes. But good God, that's a huge idea. Grandma teaching you, you got to get a good deal. You figuring out, it also means... It has to stay a good deal. It can't expire. Yes. We're not just buying yes. fruit in the grocery store. All the management lessons, all the things that turn into an accumulated experience of life. You took us all the way through McRaney's future work on genius. And I love the way that you tied this back to success. I love right. that you brought up the genius just gets the rule the fastest. Right. That might be success for one game or one round if you can find your advantage that way. But but true success is a journey, and this is maybe the most Bogomil thing ever, is that it's the journey in the fiat to the top of the mountain. There you go. I like that. It's not just, yeah, it's up to get the visibility, but then it's down mm -hmm. into yourself, into all these things, because I'm convinced that this is this is what makes you you. That's what makes this podcast so special, because... I'm going back to this idea that you said to me in our first conversation about being obsessed with planting trees 
and your grandfather's story, mm -hmm. most beautiful plant tree story maybe ever. But I can't help but think, even if that tree can't survive, if the tree is in secular decline or the neighborhood's getting turned into apartments or factories, that tree can become a book. That tree can become a desk. <laughs> that tree can become all these other things that can evolve. And what else is wealth? What else is business? But the way we put constraints around this, package it up and pass it on. You, my friend, are a true treasure. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Matt, this was, this was incredible. I thank you for the summary. I got chills just listening to you and the topics we touched on. It. What felt like a, a very rich one hour and a bit, I think we covered a lot. And yeah, I appreciate your curiosity. And I, you asked me if we should have prepared questions. And I thought, no, I think Matt likes to fly free. So let's, let's see what happens and what you come up with. But this was really incredible. So I want to thank you for taking the time and indulging me today and letting me do the talking as much as I love asking questions. So thank you so much. Thanks for being a student in the classroom with uh, <laughs> lots of questions held back. We'll get you back to the front of the class next time. Don't you worry. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Bogomil.